So the uh, year's almost over. Um, and shoot, we're halfway through John in a year. So um, John's a great book, a lot of inter- interesting stuff in it. Um, we're, tonight, um, I think you're going to see a, a John chapter 13 that you may not have ever experienced before. It's going to wind up uh, going the whole gambit into even end time stuff. and, and uh, Because John is the same John that wrote the book of Revelation. So there is... There is linkage, even though he hadn't experienced that yet. Um, John's a pretty, pretty special guy. So anyway, <clears throat> we're going to get started. Um, and uh, um, hopefully you enjoy yourself tonight. Um, and we're going to pray a minute and then we'll get going. Heavenly Father, we glorify you and we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for your son that he came so that we could have eternal life. There's so much we're thankful for. Um, We could spend all night here thanking you for what you've done. But Lord, send your Holy Spirit into this place. Send it to the, the living rooms and the bedrooms and wherever anybody is watching. And give us all wisdom and understanding to see your truth. Not our truth, your truth. Guide us and teach us, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. Okay. So, uh, John 13, verse 1. Now, it was just before the Feast of Passover. Yehoshua knew that his hour had had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them until the end. While the Seder, which the Seder is just the Jewish word for um, Passover, meal, um, was happening, the devil had already put in the heart of Judas, it's Judah here, but um, we tend to change names all throughout the New Testament to make it fit a more Americanized version, but his name was Judah, um, from Kriat. Um, we say Iscariot, that that he should hand over um, Yehoshua. To who? To the Sanhedrin. Now Yehoshua knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God as, and was go- returning to God. So Jesus knew that his time here was going to be short. 1 Corinthians 15. This, this, um, the, a friend of mine and I discussed this uh, um, verse, the verses, because um, the verses you're going to see are, cha- are verses 24 through 28. Um, and I, I never really saw it until recently, um, the depth of, and the meaning of what this says. 22, for as in Adam all die. <coughs> so also in Messiah, uh, we will be made alive. Now, the, the remember, Jesus talked about this. The first Adam, which was the one he created, and then the second Adam, which is Jesus. Um, one caused death, the other caused life. But each in his own order. Now, this is, this, this is what blew me away. This is um, in his own order is a, a a Latin term or a Greek, Greek term, both, um, that referred to a military situation, um, which the, the generals would come out first and line up, and then the lieutenants, and then, and then the majors, and then the minors, and then the, everybody behind them. So um, talking about in their order, is, is what he's talking about his followers. Um, Messiah the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Messiah. This is where I compared it to because this right here is talking about um, in his own order, in God's order, as to when he was going to take people through the resurrection. I can show you at least three different raptures in the New Testament. Um, 
one of which before the tribulation, one at the midpoint, and one at the end. And a whole different group of people, obviously. Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Now, this first resurrection is the same as in, its own, in their own order. Because this first re resurrection is a military term. First protos, anastasis, which is resurrection. But the interesting thing in that particular passage, um, most commonly that resurrection is, is describing resurrecting one's history, not their physical being. So this, it, when you see it in Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 10, as soon as they talk, right after the, the um, shortly after verse 5, you start seeing the comparison talking about the, res, the first resurrection, the first bringing up of one's history. And then what does it talk about? It says the books were open. What books? The books of Psalm 139, where it says everything that every step I would take in my life, David's talking, the, the, every step I would take in my life was written in the books. There were books in heaven written about everything David was going to do. And it says when, and that when is before he was even formed in his mother's womb. So it was before conception, everything David was going to do was written, which takes you all the way forward to the book of um, uh, Romans chapter 8, where it's talking about where people get the misguided understanding of um, predestination. Because they're saying that uh, to those he foreknew, he predestined. Who did he foreknew? The ones that chose him in the books that were written even before they were conceived. He knew who was going to choose him. But we twist that to say that no, God chooses who's going to be chosen. And that's wrong. God chose based on what you chose. <sighs> First resurrection, protos, uh, first, resurrection, anastasis. Um, and we just talked about that, that it is bringing up someone's history. Now, that's at the white throne judgment. That's what that's talking about, protos, anastasis. Um, is they're going to bring, God is going to open up the books of what you did in your life. And, and the people who were, our Christian will not be standing there being judged at that. We go to the beam of judgment for reward. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. But the white throne judgment is for those who are being cast into hell. And so those books are open, and because their name is not in the book of life, there's no blood to take away all the stuff that kept, will keep them from going into heaven. And that's why we're not there, because... That we have the blood that takes away anything that would be negative in that book, in the books of our history. They're gone. They're wiped out. Never to be seen again. New beginning. Verse 4. <clears throat> so he gets up from the meal and lays aside his outer garment. And taking a tower, towel, uh, he wrapped it around his waist. <coughs> And then he pours water into a basin. He began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel wrapped around himself. <coughs> Excuse me. Then he comes to Simon Peter, who says to him, Master, are you going to wash my feet? Now, this is a triclinium, and some of you have heard me teach this before. But a triclinium, we see the pictures of the Last Supper of people sitting in a chair around tables, and it, it's not the way it is. Now, this was a Roman and a Greek setting. The tables were short. They were laying on mattresses because the Romans and the Greeks, would. this would go for days. And where do we see a picture of that? Isaiah chapter 28, uh, verses 1 through 10. And those guys are so drunk, it says they're vomiting all over the table, they're vomiting all over the floor, and they're mocking God. And that's where we see them say four times in two verses, they say, 
line upon line, precept upon precept, and then they repeat it again. So they're mocking God that you can take a book and you can put the line upon line, precept upon precept, and make sense of it. But they're having a drunken stupor party on a triclinium. That's what this setup is called, a triclinium. It's a short table, and the reason it's short, and the reason they're laying on basically mattresses or giant pillows, is because when they get drunk, they don't have fire to fall. And that's exactly why they did it. So in this situation, imagine that there are 13 people, the 12 disciples and Jesus, um, sitting around having the, the, the Last Supper. At least we refer to it as the Last Supper, the Passover Seder. Now, there is, there is a system that, I don't know if it was the Jews or whether it was God himself, who set up the system, the seating arrangement, at Passover Seders. So, think of it, you're looking at it this way. And on the far left, this seat right here would, was reserved for the best friend of the one throwing the Seder. Now, who was the Seder? Jesus. Who was the best friend? John. Even John is so humble, he says, yeah, I, I, Jesus sat next to the one he loved. Yeah, well, that was himself. There was nothing humble about that statement. So John is laying here. And then the next place in the, in the arrangement would have been the one throwing the Seder, which is Jesus. <coughs> so, in a, you know, I don't know. I guess we've got, it's taken us 12 months to get through 13 chapters. So by the time we get to nine, chapter 9, it'll be summer and we'll be going to the fireworks tonight. And, and, and so, but anyway, you, what, what you're going to see um, in there is obviously John... John is, um, it says that he is, he is, it says that he rolled back into the chest of Jesus. So you can see they would have, it was a requirement <coughs> because it was, it was, it was a sin, it was not really a sin, but it was inappropriate to feed yourself at a Passover Seder with your left hand, even if you were left handed. They, because the right hand symbolized the right hand of God. That's why Jesus sits at the right hand of God. So they had to feed themselves with their right hand. And, and so they would lay on their left hand and they would feed themselves. And then John says he rolled back into the bosom of Jesus, which makes sense because Jesus would be here. John was here. This is the best friend of the one throwing it. This is the one throwing it. And then... Next to the one throwing it would be the honored guest, the one who was most significant there. And in this particular case, for one Passover, that would have been Judas Iscariot. Because without Judas, none of this matters. If no one turns Jesus in and Jesus is not crucified, then, then Satan was successful and Jesus failed. But this man, Jesus, he has to be right next to Jesus because um, they're, Jesus should have shared the cup with the guy to his right, which would have been John. But Jesus said, the one who I dip the cup in and share the bread is the one that will betray me. So Jesus actually laying on his left hand, reached across his, his, his body and dipped into the cup with Judas and then Judas ate. And, and so at that point, Judas is relieved and said, now you can go. Jesus works his way all the way around. When, when we're talking about what we just read, Rich and I talked about this earlier, about um, Jesus washing their feet. So Jesus starts here with John and works his way all the way around the table until he gets to this seat right here, the last seat. Now, who was there? It says that Peter, look, when, when Jesus said, one of you at this table will betray me, it says that he looked across the table, Peter did, at John, and said, do you know? Do you know who? So Peter was sitting here. So we know John, Jesus, Judas, Peter. 
Now, why is it significant that Peter is sitting there? Because Jesus goes all the way around washing everybody's feet, and everybody lets him until he gets to Peter. Now, why did Peter, I mean, it wasn't because Peter was special. They were all special in Jesus' eyes. Why did Peter say, I should be washing your feet, not you washing mine? Because every seat had a specific responsibility. And this seat's responsibility was to wash everyone's feet before the meal started. And Peter thought, thought that was beneath him, so he didn't. That's why Jesus says, what did you see here? What do, why do you think I did what I did? Because humble yourself. Now I'm going to show you, I think I put in here a couple more verses. Yehoshua responded, you don't know what I'm doing now. But you will understand after these things. That's what he's talking about. You don't understand what it means to humble yourself, to, to get down on your knees before someone and handle their dirty feet. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Yehoshua answers him, If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Why? Because now you're saying, you know, you know how bad what you did was, or you should have done. If you don't let me correct this, you got, you're not part of me because you still don't get it. I'm humbling myself. Don't you see it? No, he didn't. Simon Peter said to him, Master, then not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Why? Because he didn't want the Messiah to just handle what was stinky from the, from, from the desert. And <coughs> I, um, I, get, I, I, I hear people say, you know, from a certain denomination that will that will get on me about our church because we, you know, I've been known to wear shorts sometimes in the summer and sandals. Um, and they will say, you wouldn't do that if you knew Jesus was coming tomorrow. You, you, you'd, you'd dress appropriately to go to church if you knew Jesus was going to show up that day. I said, I said, well, that's the difference between your church and mine. Jesus shows up every day. <laughs> that didn't go over well, but but then um, and 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 I said so I said, and the problem with what you just said is that you're washing the outside of the cup, but the the inside of the cup is full of dead men's bones and all corruption. And I said and, and I said I said so I w I would do exactly the same because G you think Jesus cared about clothes? I said. Every time that man walked into synagogue, it was after spending two weeks or a, a week in the desert with no shower, no nothing. And he comes in off of the desert in his sandals with his feet filthy and goes in and heals the sick. So what do we put importance on? Because we focus on all the wrong things. But we're not alone. I mean, they did it then too. But I, I know I'm going off track here, but you know, if you know me by now, I'm on I'm I'm on more rabbit trails than I am straight trails. <coughs> Yahoshua said to him, He who has bathed has no need to wash. Ah, imagine that, we just talked about it. Except the feet. He is completely clean, and you all are clean, though not everyone. He knew who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. So after he had washed their feet and put his robe back on, and, and you were right, Judas was here when he was washing his feet, um, he said to them, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and master, and rightly, uh, for I am. So if I, your master and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to watch, wash each other's feet. Huh. Huh. Maybe we should humble ourselves. I know um, Jack, when he runs street late, one time he had a whole night um, where he and a couple other people, um, some of us were out in the streets witnessing, but um, Jack and two other people were in, in that room over uh, in, on the other side um, washing people's feet. And I have never been a part of doing that, 
but I have heard that it is just mind-blowingly um, touching and emotional and because you are humbling yourself. Luke 22. But there was also a quarrel among them about which of them is considered the greatest. So I'm just making examples of why they didn't understand what Jesus was doing. It's not about how, let me humble myself. It's which one of us, which one of us is greater than each other. Matthew 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came with their son with her sons to Joshua. And she was kneeling down and asking t something from him. What do you want? He said to her. She said, declare that these two sons of mine might sit one on your right and one on your left. She don't even know what she's talking about. Because on, who's on Jesus' left? God the Father. Oh yeah, let me, let me bump your, your, your sons out of my father's place. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. But this is this is where we're talking. I mean, humble yourself. That's what he's trying. His last lesson: humble yourself. I have given you an example. You should do for each other what I have done for you. I mean, I mean, I tell you, a servant isn't greater than his master, and the one who is sent isn't greater than the one he um, who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. So, you follow what he's saying here? You know these things. If you know these things, um, you are blessed when you do them. So knowing them doesn't do anything for you, except condemn you in the end. Because he will say, did you not know? Did you not know? And then he'll say, but you didn't do. I am not speaking to all of you. <coughs> I know whom I have chosen. But so the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread and, and has lifted up his, his heel against me. <coughs> <coughs> now this is interesting. I am not speaking to all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But so the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. So what is he saying there? Who's he talking about? Judas, but Judas is inhabited by Lucifer. Genesis 3. Why did he say this comment has lifted his heel against me? To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pain from conception to labor. Which means you've had children before. But that was before you sinned. Now you're going to have a lot of pain. You didn't before. So now there were a lot of children born before sin. I know that's anti-biblical. But it's right here. In pain will you give birth to children. Your desire will be towards your husband. Now I know that's not feminist. But I don't believe Jesus is a feminist. But he loves women. Yet he must rule over you. Adonai Elohim, the Lord God himself, said to the serpent, Because you did this, cursed are you above all the livestock and above every animal of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust will you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he, who's he, will crush your head. This is Eve's seed, which is Jesus, because Jesus is the only one ever that was the seed of the woman. Everyone else is the seed of a man, because there was no man involved with, this, with the seed of Jesus. He will crush your head. So Jesus, her seed, will crush your head, and you will crush his heel. Wait a minute, what did we just read? He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Talking about Judas and Lucifer.
and I will put uh, enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and, and Jesus will crush his, the seed of the serpent's head, and you will crush his heel. Now, what does that mean? Because, again, most of you, if not all of you, at some point has heard me say that the Bible is literal. And I know it's popular among so many, unfortunately, so many denominations, so many seminaries, to say that it's allegorical. But it's literal. So what does that, how can that be literal if he's going to crush the head of the seed of the ser serpent, with the serpent being the dragon, which is S Lucifer, and you will crush his heel. The seed of the serpent will crush, crush the heel. First Samuel 17, let's, let's look, uh, look that over. It says, David took the head of the Philistine and brought it into Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his own tent. Now, why would he bring the head of the Philistine, the giant, to Jerusalem? Now, the giant is what the scripture refers to as a Nephilim, um, and which, which is a half human, half, it's a demigod. It's an angel that came down in, in Genesis 6 and took the daughters of men and created the legends of old. Zeus was real. Neptune was real. Now, they were exaggerated, probably, their powers, but they were real. But Neptune wasn't the god of all the seas because that, that was God. But, um, um, and, and Zeus was not the god of the heavens because that's God. But... But they, but they were exaggerated. Their powers were exaggerated, but there was some um, truth to it. So, um, David took the head of the Philistine giant to Jerusalem. Now, what did he do that for? Because um, in, the, uh, in, in Jerusalem, it was, Jerusalem was ruled and, and possessed at that time by Canaanite, a segment of the Canaanites, which is the Jebusites. And nobody could overthrow them because it was a, quite a fortified city. So um, David took the head of Goliath and chastised them from Mount Moriah, more than likely, um, and, and, or, or the mountain where Jesus was crucified, one of the two. And, um, and uh, he, would, he would mock them and say, I'm coming for you next. This is the greatest enemy that Israel and, and, and even the Jebusites have ever had. And here he is. Here he is. I'm gonna, I, take, I brought him to the highest hill because that was Jewish tradition. In English, we say the giant's name was Goliath. But that is an English translation. So what is the, the Greek words or even the Hebrew words for Goliath. We get it from the from two words, Gola and Gatha. So if I put Gola and Gatha, as we've talked many times, that words in Hebrew become you, you create a word with a specific meaning if you take two different words and put them together. So let's put them together. Matthew twenty seven. And when they came to a place called Gola, Gotha. Um, that is to say, the place of a skull. Now, I know you guys, I mean, I'm not ancient of days. I'm 64. I'm not ashamed to say that. Um, I am 64. And I have heard this all of my life. So I know you've had to hear it. That Gola, Gotha is a hill that looks... We see a, and every pastor I've ever heard preach a sermon, if he had a, a picture overlay or whatever, they would show a picture of a hill with something that looked like recessed eye sockets and maybe a hole where a nose once was. And they say, see, this is the place that looked like a skull. Does anybody see anywhere on here that says they took, he took his head to the place that looked like a skull? He said, no. He said, he, he took it to a place of a skull. What skull? Gola, 
Gotha is, is, it was the name of the giant. And the giant was taken to a hill. And according to Jewish legend, the Jew, David would have buried that head in that tallest to rem as an always a remembrance for generation after generation um, that, that this is where God, this is the promise that God made <coughs> that when we take this land, it will be over the seed of the serpent's head. And that's why it says, <coughs> he shall bruise your heel. Now, we've talked about this many times. Can they see me if I stand over here? If I stand here and pretend I'm on a cross, because we always heard that Jesus' feet were crossed and they put a spike through his, the tops of his feet. But they actually put the heels up on the, on the side of the, the cross like this and drove the spikes through their heels. So his heel, Jesus' heels, were crushed by the seed of the serpent, which are the people who are following Lucifer, who are crucifying the Messiah. And they're doing it over the top of the skull of the seed of the serpent. So in that, in that whole picture, you can see that the prophecy, when he told Eve that, that her seed will crush the head of the serpent's seed, and that seed, and, and the serpent seed shall bruise your heel. It was literal. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say, but it's literal. It actually happened. That makes it literal. Ah, from now on, I am telling you before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe that I am. See, <coughs> he is getting tired of not being taken seriously and he's saying okay you dingbats this is what's going to happen and and I'm telling you now because otherwise there's no way you would believe me because there's no way anybody could predict all the things that are about to happen but he does and they do and the disciples not surprisingly still don't believe I mean I mean I tell you he who receives the one I send receives me. And he who receives me receives the one who sent me. Pretty simple. <clears throat> He's saying, if you receive the Messiah that I send you, then you receive the one who sent me, which is the Father. After he said these things, Yehoshua was agitated. Hey, disciples seem to have that effect on him. Yehoshua was agitated in spirit and testified, I mean, I mean, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at each other perplexed. Who was he talking about? What does he mean? Who's dumb enough to, to take on the Messiah? They had just met in Caesarea Philippi, and Peter didn't even know what he was saying, but he said, yeah, you are the Messiah, the son, of, the son of the Most High God. But he truly didn't get it in his heart. That was the Holy Spirit that, that convicted him. One of, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at his table. Okay, here's John, being humble, because John wrote this. The one that Jesus loved the most, because I'm the best, is what Simon Peter nods to him and says, See, ask him, who is he talking about? Who's the one that's going to betray me? Well, again, I put the picture up again, because John is here, Peter is here, he's going, What? Who's he talking about? Judas. And Judas, because now he's indwelled by the by Satan himself, he doesn't he doesn't even he doesn't even resist. Then he who leaned on Jehoshua's Je chest, and this is what we talked about a minute ago, 
um, says to him, Master, who is it? Yehoshua answered, It's the one I will give this bit of matzah to after I dip it. He takes it and gives it to Judah um, from Creole, the son of Simon. And with that bit, Satan entered into him. Then Yehoshua tells him, What you're about to do, do it quickly. Now, is, is, is Judas even paying attention? Because Jesus said, the one who's going to betray me is going to take this from me. And then he dips it in and, take, and gives it to him. Now, he wasn't possessed yet, but about to be. And he took it. I know, if, I would hope if it was me, I would go, oh, no, 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 not me. I'm not taking that thing. But he didn't. He took it. Verse 28, But no one reclining at the table knew why Yehoshua said this to him. Since Judah had the money box, <coughs> some thought Yehoshua was telling him, Buy what we need for the feast. <coughs> or that he should give something to the poor. <coughs> now I think that's interesting because our uh, pastor who I love dearly, he's a great pastor, just brought up uh, the last two weeks that he never really realized until later in his, in his pastoral ship that Jesus was a philanthropist, that he would give he gave a lot of money to the poor because we don't really focus on that when we talk about Jesus. We talk about Jesus, the Lamb of God. We talk about Jesus, the Messiah, the one who shed his blood for us, the one that the healer, all the things. But when do we hear about Jesus, the one who gave, who gave money? But he did. There are plenty of non-biblical writings that say so doesn't mean they're not accurate. So after Judas received the bit of matzah, he left immediately. Now it was night. So, you know, most of you have heard, but there may be someone watching, maybe more than one, who has not heard me say this, but I have my own opinion as to why Judas betrayed Jesus. And because it says in Scripture that, that, Je that Jesus knew that Judas was stealing from the bag. And, and so Judas would have had an indication or an inclination that would say, Jesus is getting suspicious. I need to make this bag right. So um, it wouldn't surprise me at all because back in, uh, I'm trying to remember, is it Isaiah? That or is it Zechariah that says that he will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver? I think it's Isaiah. And um, my, it wouldn't surprise me one bit, knowing the way Jesus teaches and the way he writes, and the way, that Judas had, was 30 pieces of silver short in the bag. And that's why he asked for 30 pieces of silver, to make it right. And knowing that all the times he had seen Jesus in his ministry, get cornered by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, and the, and the, um, the Judean uh, military, uh, and Jesus just walks through the crowd or teleports or whatever. Um, and my, the, why would he ever doubt that if they cornered him again, Jesus would just escape? So he betrays him, knowing that I'll make the bag right, but Nothing, no harm will come to Jesus. He'll just walk out the back way. And when he sees, that's why if you look, when, when he sees that Jesus actually gives himself up and goes before the tribunal, that's when Judas is throwing the coins back into the temple. He's throwing a fit. And when, when none of that works, he is so distraught, he goes and hangs himself. He wouldn't do that if he, had under, if he thought that all this was really going to happen. I don't think. I wouldn't. I, hopefully, I wouldn't do any of it to begin with. But uh, Verse 31. Then when Judah had gone out, Yehoshua said, 
Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. Now, that is Jesus' greatest um, attribute, his greatest uh, accomplishment. Um, It was his purpose, other than, than dying for our sins, was to please and glorify the Father. That is what he does. That is what the Holy Spirit does. And then we are supposed to glorify Jesus and the Holy Spirit so that they, in turn, can take that glory and, and, return and, and bestow it on the Father. <coughs> if God is glorified in him, God will glorify him uh, in himself and will glorify him at once. Now, that sounds like a complicated statement. <coughs> but it says, if God is glorified in him, Jesus, then God will glorify him, Jesus, in himself. It, it's again, it's that reciprocal or recirculating glory from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit to the Holy Spirit to the Son to the Father, and they never quit glorifying each other. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will search for me, and just as I told the Judean leaders, so I say to you now, where I am going. You cannot come, not yet. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. And that is a new commandment. Just as I have loved you, so also you must love one another. What did we, I didn't put these verses in there, but Romans chapter 13, verse 8, um, Galatians 5, 13? I think it's 13. Um, No, it's 14. um, Where it says that if you have loved your neighbor and loved God, loved your neighbor as yourself, um, you have completed the law. So that's how important loving your neighbor is. Because if you love your neighbor, you won't break the commandments against them. If you love God the Father, you won't break the commandments against him. You You will treat them the way you want to be treated. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. Master, where are you going? Simon Peter said. Joshua says, where I am going. You cannot follow me, not now. But you will follow me later. Peter said to him, Master, why can't we follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. Peter's funny. He's, I mean, he's just always... Running his mouth. Ah, you don't know how good I am. You don't know how strong I am. You don't know how I, I'm the best. I, I'll do this. Yeah, right. I don't think so. I don't think so. But he's always willing to run his mouth. Yehoshua answers, Will you lay down your life for me? I mean, I mean, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. As many times as I've kind of made fun of Peter. I got a funny feeling Jesus is going to make me sit next to him at the wedding supper of the Lamb. Do you not let your heart be troubled? Um, Trust in God. Trust always in me. uh, Now we're on John 14, verse 1. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you. Now, I think that's interesting. As we've talked before, um, this is the Jewish betrothal, and that's what the rapture is. And then after after the betrothal in the city square, um, the groom was required to go back to his father's house and build an addition on a place for his bride. And that's what Jesus is saying here. I'm going back to my father's house to prepare a dwelling for each of you, my bride. It's so incredible how all of Jewish tradition uh, concerning weddings and and husband and wife relationships are, are pretty much the whole gospel. It's incredible how you can break it down and how, how simple Jesus made it that all of these customs for Jewish weddings and Jewish marriages are all over the scripture as far in, in our 
and what Jesus expects of us. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may also be. He's talking about the tribulation. So when people say that there's no pre-trib rapture, when are we going to go there? It says right here that we're going there. But if there's no pre-trib rapture, when are we going there? Because after the tribulation, we come here. So what is the purpose of this statement if we're never really going there? Again, is this allegorical or is it, is it, is it literal? It's literal. We will be there with him. <coughs> Those who are raptured will be there for seven years. And you know the way to where I am going. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John, chapter 14, verse, what is it, 51? There's no mysteries in the Bible. Jesus isn't trying to trick us into going to hell. He wants as many as possible to be in heaven. He's not trying to trick us. The answers to every question that he asks or that he poses um, is there. It's in the Bible. Read it. Look for it. It's there. Five. Thomas said to him, Master, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Well, Thomas, maybe you should pay attention in class. Because we've just had three years of class. And I've talked about it how many times. Don't daydream out the window. Yahushua said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Huh. Huh. I would say that's probably a good definition. If you have come to know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know uh, him, and you have seen him. How did, we, how did they see him? Because they saw Jesus. Philip said, Master, show us the Father, and, and, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long at, uh, at uh, a time, and you haven't come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do they not, they're, they're not getting it, that he is the Messiah. He told them he was the Messiah. Even Peter, out of his own mouth, said he was the Messiah. But nobody's repeating that. It's like, it, it was like it was a one-off. They forgot all about it until Jesus' resurrection. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father dwelling in me does his works. I mean, he's now he's, he's just being point blank and saying, my Father and I are one. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or at least believe because of the works themselves. I mean, I mean, I tell you, he who puts his trust in me, the works that I do, he will do, and greater than these, he will do. <coughs> to me, that's amazing. <clears throat> He's saying, yeah, you can believe in me, and we've talked about this many times, that four to five or maybe even six times Jesus says, believe in me. But you can believe in Jesus and still go to hell, and a lot will. I mean, we talked about this, we were talking about it beforehand, that Satan, Lucifer, and one-third of the angels all believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but they're not going to be in heaven. But they didn't follow Jesus. So four to six times, four to six times it says that um, to believe in me, but almost 30 times he says, follow me. And if you follow him, he has certain expectations that you will do as he did. You will walk as he walked. You will pray, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You will speak in other tongues. You will do all these things. Um, you will do at least some of those things. Right. Because I am going to the Father 
and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So if we do things and we do not doubt, um, and, we, and we speak it in Jesus' name, or in Yahushua's name, as we have talked about, if we, if we speak in Yahushua's name, and it's in his will, but that doesn't mean that, um, that we don't know if he will do it. We just need to know what his will is. And we get that by understanding his word. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Anything. As long as it's in his, his father's will. And that's as far as we're going tonight. That takes us through verse 14. I didn't change that. It's John. That's John chapter 14. I should have changed it from 13. But um, but we'll pick up next time um, on the 19th, right, Dan? The 19th of December. Um, but until that time, um, I'm going to say something we say in our in our shorts, and we are. Um, also, um, if, you, if you know people who do not have Facebook but would like to tune in and see what we talk about or, or view Jesus Shorts, which I don't know if you're familiar with those, but we are making three to five minute segments now with little bullet points of, of what Jesus is. Um, and it is now available, correct, on YouTube. Um, where do we go? Oh, there'll be a link. There'll be a link on the on the streetlight page, um, and can you get to it even if you don't have Facebook? Okay. Good. Cool. All right. So anyway, our YouTube is up, um, and uh, it's available, and we're going to make it, it. It will be on the the Facebook um, homepage, right? Uh, streetlight Facebook homepage. So thank you for tuning in, and. Um, you know, Jack always says that uh, that who knows how long these videos will be up. Um, matter of fact, a month ago, Facebook blocked our videos from being up because it was an election and we were talking about Jesus. And I don't know, they must have been deathly afraid we were going to talk about abortion or something because they blocked us. They blocked our shorts and they blocked our um, our teaching. Um, so if you if four weeks ago you weren't able to see us, it's that's why because Facebook blocked us. Um, but hopefully, uh, um, in our lifetime, I'm fully believing and in, in expecting the rapture. And after we leave here, I'm hoping these videos are still available. So we want people to know how to receive Jesus, because even in the tribulation, you can accept Jesus as long as you don't accept the mark. As soon as you take the mark, the game is over. And that mark will more than likely be a computer chip and you have to worship the beast to do that. So um, if you're seeing this now and you're, um, and you're saved, um, that's great. But w in, in case you're seeing this after the rapture or you're not in, in any case, if you're not saved, I just want to um, ask you to, to say this little prayer if, if you want to know Jesus. Um, please repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus. We glorify him and we believe and I confess that Jesus is the son of God. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my sins and I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I, real, and I know now that I am born again and I am in the kingdom for all eternity. I will, I will be with you in your precious name. Amen. Thank you again for tuning in, and we'll see you in a couple weeks.